OK, so uh, this is the obligatory title slide with my contact information. Uh, it's going to, we're going to talk about fuzzing embedded software using GPUs. Uh, as a quick warning, I'm going to have a lot of material to go through, and I'm going to try my best to cover it both quickly and efficiently. Uh, but if you don't get to any everything, or if you have any questions, please find me after this talk. Like this is a topic I literally talk about for hours, so there is lots and lots of stuff we can discuss. Uh, so first up, a preview of what we're going to discuss. Uh, normally, when people hear about fuzzing things as GPUs, they're going to think that we are fuzzing the GPU itself. Uh, we may do that on accident, but that is not the goal here. Uh, what we're actually going to do is we are going to take a binary, uh, ideally something small like a function or a firmware image. Uh, we're going to translate it to LLVM. Uh, we are going to link in and transform it in a bunch of interesting ways. And out will come a GPU kernel uh, in NVIDIA PTX. And then we are going to run this target program on many inputs uh, in massively in parallel on a GPU and see which ones cause a default. Uh, also, I wanted to set some expectations before we go. Uh, so first of all, uh, normally when people talk about fuzzing things, there's lots of CVEs in their talks. There's going to be no CVEs here. Uh, this is a research project that is meant to answer whether like this is technically possible. This is not a production uh, fuzzer that's going to have CVEs popping out. Uh, also, this is not magical. Uh, I did not find a magical way to take you know, normal binaries and run them on the GPU uh, massively at scale without any kinds of issues. Uh, there's, there's, there's clear limitations, which I'll try to get into, namely in terms of like the working set of the target program, some translation limits, and so on. Uh, importantly, there's also an enormous amount of unexplored opportunities about how this could be even better and faster, some of which I'll try to talk to at the very end if I have time to get to it, which I hope I will. And if not, find me later. I'd love to talk about this as well. So, a uh, quick outline of how this is going to work out. Uh, first, we're going to talk about why you would ever want to do this, like why you would want to fuzz in GPUs. Then we're going to have a quick theoretical and architectural dive into how the fuzzing problem maps to the kinds of problems that GPUs are good at solving. Then we're going to talk about our implementation, uh, how this whole process actually works and what doesn't work. Uh, we will have uh, one slide on benchmarks. Uh, I'm not going to have time for a demo, but if you find me afterwards, you can like see me try to have a failing live demo. Uh, so after, I can try to do this for you. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about some limitations, some which are obvious and some which are not obvious, and then ideally discuss some really cool future research ideas that are even more out there than what I'm talking about now. Uh, so first up, why would you want to fuzz in GPUs? Uh, this is a graph of essentially throughput at a base clock for GPUs versus CPUs. Uh, this graph stops in 2016 because the NVIDIA CUDA programmer's guide stopped including it afterwards. Uh, but it only goes, effectively, it continues going like this. Uh, and this graph is representative of effectively every single problem that is bound by throughput. So like, think of this as like cryptocurrency mining, uh, like physics simulations, password cracking. Uh, and this hockey stick graph only keeps diverging. And so C GPUs are really, really good at having lots of throughput. Uh, also, Moore's law is actually still very much alive. Uh, there's continuous semiconductor process improvements, and we keep packing more and more transistors onto the same die. Uh, however, if when you're using CPUs, it doesn't really feel like things are getting any faster. Uh, things seem like just a little bit better than the year before. But with GPUs, things are actually getting noticeably faster all the time. And it, like, it really feels like you're like doing software development work in the 90s, where your CPU doubled in speed every month, and like you could just wave away hardware problems. Uh, and like, first, why this is the case, you have to look at the architectural differences between how CPUs and GPUs work. Whereas a CPU takes its big transistor budget and spends it on very complex circuitry, such as, you know, obviously, uh, like a big MMU, lots of cache, a very complex memory hierarchy that tries to seem both fast and vast in size, uh, various kinds of speculative execution tricks and other branch prediction, things like that. A GPU doesn't do that. They take the transistor budget and they dedicate it to an enormous amount of very simple execution cores, and they let the programmer handle the very complex memory hierarchy details instead of dedicating silicon to it. Uh, and this also gives us 
an economic uh, aspect to this. Another reason why we'd want to fuzz in GPUs. So the main use of GPUs uh, is uh, machine learning models uh, at, at the margin, like at least on like data center scale GPUs. When your machine learning, when your GPU is no longer good for running machine learning models because a much better, faster one has come out in the past 18 months, uh, you still have it in your cloud system, but you're, nobody's using it, almost nobody, but the capital costs have already been paid. Therefore, you just need to like keep it there long enough to prevent somebody from taking it out. So the costs uh, per thread of GPUs, uh, especially older model GPUs, which are useless for machine learning, is actually really good. Like the pricing of them is phenomenally good for what you get. You just have to find a way to use all of that like cheap compute power that's floating out there. Uh, and this brings us to why, how to actually do about do fuzzing on a GPU, how to match up these problems. Uh, so the best way of visualizing the kinds of problems that a GPU can solve is to imagine taking your whole problem space. And if you can take your whole problem space and chop it up into a grid where each part of the grid you can solve independently and out of order, and then combine those partial solutions into a full solution, your problem is a great algorithmic fit for GPUs. Uh, thankfully, fuzzing already fits this model. You have effectively an infinite execution space of program inputs. You can slice them up any way you want to, and you can run each input against your target out of, out of order. And you know when one of them succeeded and when one of them failed. And this is like, thankfully, like fuzzing just fits this model to a T. Uh, normally, whenever you're doing anything on a GPU, the hardest problem is to take your soft, like to take the problem and make it fit what the GPU can do algorithmically, because the GPU can solve like this one set of problems very, very well. And like this whole graduate course is dedicated to like taking algorithms and hammering them away into this thing. But that is done for us. Uh, but the problem that we have is uh, architectural. So obviously, GPU uses a completely custom ISA. Uh, there's no OS. Uh, the memory model is totally different from what you're normally used to. And in order to talk about how we can solve and define away parts of this problem, we have to do a very quick dive into GPU architecture. And so the block analogy I had is actually very, very literal. So uh, a GPU is made up of these compute module called SMs, called streaming multiprocessors. And each block of your target problem input maps almost directly onto a hardware SM. And then each SM has several execution units on it. Uh, you try to actually overload the SM. You give it more like work than it actually has physical CPUs for because what is going to happen is a lot of the time uh, you are going to be waiting for memory to arrive from the bus. So a GPU executes things much faster than it can receive, can be fed with memory to do it. So you overload things and you may try to make sure you're always processing something while something else is waiting for memory. Uh, but this, uh, so a certain amount of blocks are gonna be assigned to this SM. And then finally, each SM has the actual execution threads. Uh, each block is divided into threads and threads are share block level resources. And so you're gonna share things like cache, uh, you're going to share things like registers, and you're gonna share things like memory. And how much of this each thread gets depends on your block size. And you can configure the block size whenever you're launching your, uh, your GPU kernel. And another very, very important thing to keep in mind, which is very critical for performance, is that a GPU executes 32 threads at a time. Uh, this is called a warp. And uh, this is not, so this is technically not true, but a good way of Thinking about this analogy is imagine that each of these hardware execution threads has a hardwired program counter line, and they must execute the same program counter at every execution. And if it just and if you reach a branching condition, then uh, every thread still executes both sides of the branch, except the results of one of those are uh, masked off and unused. Uh, with obviously the pathological case being that you have some kind of switch statement, every thread takes a different position in that switch statement, and you turn your really high throughput, awesome parallel processor into a very, very slow serial processor with a big memory bandwidth problem. And so what problems do we have to overcome to get this to work? Uh, one, wrong ISA. Uh, two, there's absolutely no operating system. 
uh, the amount of memory you have is actually really tiny, at least the amount of fast memory you have. So your GPU comes with a lot of like big slow memory, but even then when you divide it by thousands and thousands of execution threads, it's actually not that much. And you have even less smaller fast memory, which is critical to keeping your executions fed. Uh, your memory hierarchy is totally different than what you're used to. And you have to make sure that you keep the execution fed and you keep things executing the same code as much as you possibly can. Uh, first up, how do we work around the instruction set architecture? Uh, well, the traditional way to do this is to make an emulator. Uh, the better way to do this, because we, so at Trail of Bits, we do a lot of program analysis and transformation work, and it just so happens that we have a lot of program lifting tools, which take a binary and translate it to LLVM. Just, we had just have a lot of these laying around that operate on different architectures. And so, you know, when everything, well, all we have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we went ahead and we uh, did this and we took some ARM code and we said, hey, can we take this and use the NVIDIA and use Clang's, uh, PTX back and to commit it as a GPU kernel. And after some experimentation, the answer is yes. So we can, instead of making an emulator, we make a static translator. Uh, there's also no OS and importantly, no libc. Uh, and there's no memory protection. So if you have a fault in your target, you are going to bring down the whole GPU kernel and your fuzzing run ends. And you're not gonna get like a signal notifying you, it's just gonna terminate everything. Uh, we can't take an existing target and say, rebuild it with Clang's PTX backend because like, certain operations just don't exist anymore. Like you just can't, like this is not a thing you can really do. Uh, our solution to this is to simply avoid the OS and libraries and to just translate it at the binary image where we have, uh, can do a fairly good support for CPU and memory operations by number one, statically translating the instruction set. And number two, we're going to have an MMU that gives us visibility into every memory access. Uh, and since there's obviously a lot of static translation issues, the bigger your program gets, the harder this is, you can focus this on embedded devices and small platforms to keep your scope manageable. Uh, the big problem everybody talks about, like if you Google up, like how do I run CPU code on a GPU? Number one, a lot of people are gonna tell you it's impossible. And then number two, people are gonna go into reasons why. And the reasons why you don't do this is, uh, normally when you have like traditional program operations, you want like fast things that are low latency and interactive. Uh, GPUs are not like that. They're designed for batch processing with high throughput and high latencies. But with fuzzing, we get to effectively define away the problem. Uh, so this is a graph from a paper by Andrew Ruth and some of his collaborators about measuring fuzz testing. And it represents a lot of what you see whenever you're fuzzing a program. So you have like this ramp up cycle where you're lots, you're finding new code a lot of the time. And then you have this like really long slog where finding any kind of new code is extremely rare. Uh, this turns out that this is extremely good for a GPU fuzzing use case. So like I said, the thing that we want to avoid at all costs is having each thread of a GPU do different work based on an input. And thankfully, like in the long term, finding new code, that is having like your input generate new coverage that you were not aware of before is an extremely rare event. Like that's a very rare and thankful occurrence. And so we get to optimize for like the common case of hammering away against the very specific program branch and not finding anything. And we get to do that really, really fast. So we effectively get to define away a lot of the divergence problem. Oh, come on. No, oh, wait, no, there we go, wrong button. Uh, so the other problem is limited memory. So you have a very limited amount of slow, oh, sorry, you have a very limited amount of fast memory and you have a lot more of slow memory. And you have to then make very judicious use of what you have available. So uh, what this ends up being is that you can actually handle large programs as long as you do one of like a few simple things. So one is you can take a snapshot of it at a very specific point in execution and then fuzz from the snapshot. Since you're working at a binary anyway, you have an entry point, you have like a memory layout, so you load the snapshot into your GPU and then like you translate your target function and you run it. You can also focus simply on very small functions and that's mainly been my test target is like I take, I make a small function, I compile it and I work on the binary. Uh, you also focus on testing embedded platforms. Uh, if you're trying to fuzz an embedded platform at scale, you're gonna need an emulator. Like you're, there's no real way around it. Uh, you're gonna have to do it somehow. And if you're, you know, emulating or translating, you might as well make a really fast one that, you know, works in parallel massively instead of making a slow one. Uh, and the limitation you're gonna have is then 
uh, whenever you're fuzzing something, each of your threads is going to want to write memory. And so you will then need to do, uh, each thread then has to maintain its own like write working set. And it's very important that you have like good copy and write semantics that tries to minimize the amount of memory duplicated between each thread. Since remember, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, in the common case, your threads will be executing mostly the same stuff. And it's very important to conserve memory, to have like fairly judicious use of copy and write semantics and various deduplication to make sure that you're not using too much working memory, since that is going to be your main limiting factor. Ah, so let's talk about how this actually works. Uh, our implementation is called mullet, which is a word for hammer. And it's called that way because, as I said, you know, when you have a hammer of dynamic translation, everything starts to look like a nail. Uh, and before we discuss the exact details, let's talk about the pieces we need to get this working. So one is we need a GPU kernel. And so we're going to tr take the target program. We're going to translate it. We're going to embed instrumentation because you have to have instrumentation. Like you need to have some kind of code coverage measurement. Ideally, you can also get some like branch in information and so on. Uh, you need to implement like this MMU. You need to implement this copy and write semantics and uh, other tricks to get this to go fast. You need something to actually like take the inputs and like give it to the executor and report back as to what happened. And finally, you have a program that will figure out what inputs to give you. Uh, and so the important part, making the kernel. Uh, we're actually going to use like a live example throughout this that just happens to uh, be one of the things you tested with to make sure they could get the crashes working. Uh, so we start with a binary that runs ARM64. So this has some source code, but it's important to say that we don't actually work off of source code. Like we work off of a binary, which is the uh, other part of the slide. Uh, in this case, an ARM64, but we're not really limited by the original architecture. As long as we can lift it, we can translate and run it. Uh, we use Remill, which is an open source uh, x86. Sorry, it's an open source library that translates. Uh, various kinds of binaries to LVM bit code. Uh, it's a trail of bits project. We have a few of these. We actually have a more advanced lifter that should be able to do a better job, uh, but it needs some to tune the output to be better used for this. But so we take it and we then convert the target function to LLVM. Uh, then the problem we have is like, so we have this target function in LLVM, but we need to insert a bunch of instrumentation. Uh, thankfully, there's already a really neat LLVM-based fuzzer that like does a lot of instrumentation and mutating called libfuzzer. It comes with Clang. Maybe somebody here even works on it. I remember one of the years I talked to, the, I talked to one of the developers of it. Uh, we can actually take the libfuzzer's instrumentation pass and apply it to the LLVM, LLVM that we have. And so we implement like PC, tra PC program counter tracing. We implement branch condition tracing. And uh, I'd have to modify like the pass a little bit to be a little more compliant with what a GPU expects, but like we can do this. And then comes the interesting part is we need to add an MMU. Uh, the, every memory access has to be mediated, uh, which thankfully it is for us. Uh, I'll go back one slide. If you notice, there are these uh, effectively calls to remill read, write memory, remill read memory. So every single memory access we mediate uh, and the translation level. Uh, the MMU maps from the original program image as the target expects to see it to what we have loaded into GPU memory. And uh, the way that uh, this works is that we take the target program and then we load it up into GPU memory as it is laid out. And then we will, let's see. Yeah, this is, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, so what we do is we have this, we have this memory layout in the GPU. Uh, and then at runtime, since we don't know where in the GPU memory we're going to live until we load it, so at runtime, we actually generate a whole bunch of C++ that is going to be serve as a mapping that goes from the original program image address space to the target program image address space with the goal that if you have, the goal have a fast path, if you have a read of read-only memory such that you can statically translate it without ever having to call into an MMU uh, by just adjusting a pointer. Uh, and in case you don't have a copy on write page, then instead of having you know a static translation, just it effectively boils down to one addition operation or a subtraction operation. Uh, once you have this MMU, you need to have your own entry point. Uh, this entry point will be a bit familiar to people who have worked with uh, LLVM's libfuzzer. 
uh, it's like it's it's like using libfuzzer but way more complicated. Uh, you get to do all kinds of all of your own stuff, like put your arguments into their proper ABI locations by yourself, and you get to set up your own stack, and you get to uh, invoke your own function, and then figure out what the good or bad result for your own function is. So like all of those things that like a compiler would do for you, currently uh, you have to do yourself. Uh, the the upside is that we can in this this part is should be fairly easy to automate or semi-automate away uh, in the general case. Uh, you also need a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, you need to like glue the translation layer into the MMU. Uh, you need to provide these instrumentation handlers. So like libfuzzer creates the callbacks for you, but like you need to do something with those callbacks, which in this case is keep running hash. Uh, there is a mystery blob of stuff that comes with uh, NVIDIA's CUDA. CUDA is like NVIDIA's general purpose GPU programming library. Like you get this big blob of stuff and you just have to link it in. I have no idea what's in there, but you just have to do it. Or otherwise nothing will work. Uh, since this is all C++ based, there's a bunch of like extra stubs that your compiler emits, especially if you're dealing with virtual functions, uh, which we don't have if you're doing like compiling it to bitcode. Uh, and like you have to implement some of these on your own, otherwise it'll like crash. So you, you just have to implement these mystery API stubs as well. And so you take all of this, and then you glue it all together with LLVM link, which is a thing that like takes separate bitcode modules and makes them to one big module. Uh, then you run it through LLVM's optimizer, and ideally, uh, in this you will take all of the redundant things and you will remove them. You will do a lot of constant propagation, since I said we had like some runtime generated code to try and make a lot of MMU lookups just a constant operation. Uh, and you will then get a blob of bitcode uh, that represents your final target kernel. And then you take Clang, and then you use their PTX backend to emit it as PTX code. And as I guess as a fun fact, PTX code is actually text. It's like an assembly level language. And then when you load it in your GPU, uh, the GPU will actually then compile it to like the actual machine code that the GPU uses. So technically, this is actually not the end of the compilation process. There is more compilation that, thankfully, at least I don't have to worry about, except when you do, because during this, we had found at least one bug in the Clang PTX emitter, and we had found at least one bug in the NVIDIA assembler, which we reported to them and they fixed uh, for us. We had Obviously, like this is not like a thing that they ever expect you to do with their tooling, so I totally understand that there were bugs in it uh, in our obscure use case, but they were very, very responsive about agreeing that there was an issue, looking at our test case, and fixing it fairly quickly. So I'm very thankful for NVIDIA's developer outreach. Uh, as a quick interlude, how do you debug this? Since like you can't really like attach a debugger to your GPU code. Uh, I actually have all of this infrastructure implemented, except the very, very last part, where instead of emitting everything as a PTX kernel, we actually emit it as a shared library, uh, as an x86-64 or whatever architecture you're running on. I actually did a lot of this work on a small ARM64 machine just to make sure that I kept things cross-architecture compatible. Uh, and then you can emit like normal debugging information with it and attach with this to a debugger and actually like see what is going on. And this also means that like all of like the fuzzer infrastructure has like a dupl effectively duplicated everything such that the execution can be either GPU based or CPU based, where you just abstract away the CPU as a one warp, you know, one thread GPU for testing purposes. Uh, so now that we have a thing that hopefully got your target program as a GPU kernel, and hopefully uh, it assembled, and hopefully you avoided compiler bugs and it loads, uh, you still need a way to feed it inputs and to get the outputs. Uh, and this is the job of the executor. And so we've already went through everything up to, I guess, number three. So we're going to start with number four and talk about this from there. Effectively, how do we keep this whole process fed? Uh, the naive way that you would do this, and the way I first did it is, you have a whole bunch of inputs, and then you put them into memory, uh, and then you tell your thing, like, here are my inputs, start fetching the inputs and executing them, and you put the inputs in one after the other. Uh, this is wrong. This is the wrong way to do this. Uh, it's not obvious why this is wrong until you read a bunch of GPU programming tutorials, then they explain it. And so you are going to have a whole bunch of GPU threads fetch memory all at once. And if they are all fetching an input all at once, you're going to be constantly thrashing over your memory bus as each thing tries to fetch different parts of your memory and completely clobbers your cache. So you do not do this. What you do instead is you interleave your inputs. 
So like your first block of memory has one byte, has like the first byte of every input. And like your second block of memory has a second byte of every input. And your third block of memory has a third byte of every input. And then like you write in the code in your MMU to handle this case because normally you do not have this. So you have to have like the code to like take these pieces apart and put them back together. And this way, whenever you have a fetch on the bus, whenever the first set of threads asks for a thing from memory, every thread will read like its first byte or its first word. And so you will service that read for a whole bunch of threads at once. And then the next block is going to service read for the next bunch of threads at once. So you actually keep your threads going a lot faster instead of having each thread fight over limited cache and memory bus resources. So you, you have to do this, uh, this input interleaving. Uh, then you need to, well, then you have your thing, then you execute it, and ideally your execution goes well, uh, and then you have some kind of output, and then you need to do something with it. Like, you need to find out, like, what's a code coverage hash? Is there a fault? Uh, what do we do with this? Uh, right now, uh, I in my very limited prototype, what I have is I calculate a coverage hash of the code coverage, I record whether there was some kind of fault that the MMU caught and the faulting address, and I record the input assigned to this thread, and then I send it back to the input server, which doesn't at this point does not do anything with it. It says, okay, I, I saw it. I saw that there were some inputs. I saw there were some crashes. Here's some more random data. Uh, but in the future, uh, we could actually do a lot better. Uh, so one is you could detect various exceptional conditions, such as when you run out of copy on write pages to possibly recompile and like reset some settings. Uh, we may be able to do better diagnostics, uh, and we may be able to store like an index into the input instead of having to shuffle inputs back and forth. So like one of the other things that happens right now is, uh, and I know like I can optimize this away in several ways, but for the current in the current, I guess this is good to speak to some of the benchmarks later. In the current version, like the way that I generate inputs is like I allocate like 16 gigabytes of memory and I write random inputs into it, and then I send them up to the GPU and I run stuff against them. And this is clearly not efficient, at least for small byte mutations, because you could totally do those in line at the GPU level without copying anything. So like there is a huge room for improvement left in terms of what we do here. Uh, now discussion brings me to the input manager. Uh, so we have a thing, it listens over a socket, it receives some results, it tells you what's going on, it sends you stuff back. Uh, there is a lot of improvements that can happen here. So one of the things that uh, kind of always frustrated me, and like, but I understand why it exists. So normally when you have a fuzzer, like the thing that mutates your input and the thing that executes your target are pretty much the same thing and they're super tightly coupled. And like the reason you do this is because you don't, number one, you want to take action based on the immediate feedback that you got. And number two, uh, you don't want a lot of latency between like figuring things out about what you're mutating and running the thing because you're going to destroy your performance. In the GPU fuzzing model, uh, the thing that figures out what inputs to send and the thing that executes them have to be decoupled. Like you, you don't have a choice here. You can't have like complex like analysis tasks running on your GPU at the same time that you're doing these things. Uh, I think this is actually a big architectural improvement because what you can do then is you have then all of these free CPU cores to do longer term, more intelligent analysis about the kinds of inputs you're going to generate. And as a bonus, you already have everything in LLVM, so you can do some analysis on this intermediate representation. Uh, the other stuff that you can do is, there's no reason why this has to be a fully automated process. Like, you can put a person in front of this, like a person is going to have to look at the results anyway. Like, a, a human can do this. There's no reason a human can't do look at this in the middle of this working and then be like, I want to prioritize this other path in my input manager. And like you can do this because it's not going to affect your throughput. Your throughput is completely unrelated to how many humans are like looking and adjusting it to what this thing is doing. And you can possibly can even make it better because you can say like, I'm going to like, you know, reprioritize inputs from this other parent input and like they're focusing down the path I actually care about and like ignore this other stuff. But anyway, that's like, that's longer term improvements for the future. Oh, the other cool stuff, I'm glad I have this slide because I forgot the other cool stuff is like, you can run like symbolic execution or abstract interpretation concurrently uh, to provide you with some bounds. And so one neat thing you can do is, uh, since you have a lot of throughput, and especially like in this model, since your executor is separated from your input manager, you can actually fairly easily parallelize, like not only at the GPU level, but simply by throwing more machines and more GPUs at this, uh, ideally in like some kind of cloud situation. So you can then, uh, 
take your whole input space, you can set some bounds on it, and you can actually try at, if you're targeting a fairly small function, you can actually try to exhaustively look through everything. Uh, it becomes like kind of reachable depending on like how big the function is and how much you can prune your input space. But you can get to the parts where for like small but possibly like interesting and buggy stuff, you can exhaustively test things and you can say like, I know this is fine because I've literally tested all of it. Uh, it's like there's like the one blog post saying like there's only two billion floats, you might as well test all of them. It's kind of like this, like that. Like if you can prune your input space enough uh, and you have a fast enough way to run your target, why not just test it for every input? Some results. Uh, so I always want to caveat this. Like I need to have a results slide because people want to know how fast it works. But there's a huge caveat here is that this is not an apples to apples comparison. So I'm trying to compare my GPU fuzzing against libfuzzer. Uh, there's a few things to keep in mind and to explain this. So one, uh, libfuzzer is working here on x86 and it's working on natively compiled code. So it's doing the thing, uh, it's doing native compilation. Uh, Molet, my GPU fuzzer, is lifting an ARM64 binary and running it on a GPU. So there is a difference. One of them works at the binary level, one of them works at the source level, and one of them gets to execute things natively on a CPU at like on this native instruction set and its native speed. The other one does not. Uh, but the, the libfuzzer version also has better and more thorough instrumentation. Uh, they are able to, for instance, detect certain overwrites that like I can't detect at the binary level because like I see the stack as a big blob. I can't see bounds between different stack variables. So like they're, they do different stuff. Uh, and uh, the, I try to pick the cloud instances that would be the most fair comparison within, within reason. So I purposely found like the best cents per hour like spot price for the CPU version. And I tried to find a very reasonable uh, cents per hour spot price for an NVIDIA GPU, in this case, the T4, which is uh, several generations back from the current NVIDIA model. Uh, I tried to get a K80, which is like even one more generation back to, because it's even cheaper and it would have made these results like, even better for me. Uh, but I could not find like an adequate thing to like provision instance with it. Like G Cloud made it unusually frustrating for me to find the thing with it. Anyway, uh, there's two columns here. So one is raw executions per second, uh, and one is executions per penny, uh, since uh, that's what kind of what you care about. Since if you are scaling this out and you're paying for compute time, you care about how many executions you're getting with your, for your money. <clears throat> and this is unfortunately variable based on how your actual costs. So it's not like a nice graph, like there's like a, it's a multi-dimensional optimization problem. Uh, but either way, my, my original goal was to get this to for G the GPU to be 10 times as good at executions per dollar, or in this case percent, as a good CPU-based fuzzer. Uh, it's kind of accomplished this. Uh, so yes and no, it depends on the problem. It's not always exactly that. Sometimes, as you can see, it's even a little bit slower. Uh, yeah, so in, like, in this case, we're, we're a bit slower. In this case, we're a bit faster. It depends really on what the target address actually looks like. Uh, but there's also a lot of room for improvement in the GPU case. Like there is a lot of optimizations that are still left to make. Uh, some of them very obvious, uh, some of them not so obvious. And so I think that these results only get better. Uh, I had a, like a blog post about this about two years ago, not long after I first started working on this. And uh, there we didn't do input mutation before. And now we actually like, at least it's more of an apples to apples comparison where inputs are being mutated for both of these. And we've still kept up some of our execution edge. Uh, so, uh, so now that I talked a lot about the good things, let's talk about the bad things. Uh, the things that are going to make this not work for certain cases. Uh, there's a lot, right now, there's some limits to the st level of static translation that you have. Uh, these aren't hard limits. There's solutions to a bunch of these, but currently we can't translate, like we can't, the current static translator in here can't see past indirect control flow. Uh, you can't, it, but this is a problem that is mitigated. Uh, the, the easiest answer to this is get a better static translator, which we have. It's just a matter of adapting it for this specific task. Uh, like Ida and like Binge and Gidra, whatever, are actually really good at looking at your binary and resolving like things like jump tables and direct control flow to a set of possible targets. Uh, the other thing you can do is, which is a more general fix, and this is kind of like what Apple does for like their x86, like x86 to ARM64 stuff is, 
uh, if you're executing something and you don't know what you're going to translate is, at some point you will have, like you will try to jump to code that you don't have translated. And then you can pause that execution, you can throw it to your translator and say, great, I found a new entry point for you. And we know that like we can link this original address to this target address, relift this, uh, link it back up and run it again. Like we can, and eventually like you will get all of the program in this way. It'll be a little bit slow, but you will do it. Uh, the other limitation is runtime code generation. Like right now, this is will not handle anything that does code generation at runtime, which unfortunately happens fairly often. Uh, there is a way to kind of fix this, and this is to make a real emulator instead of a static translator. Uh, so if you have, instead of having everything statically translated, you have like a normal like fetch decode execute loop, you can generate all the runtime code you want, and you can still have most of this functionality. There's other trade-offs involved, but like you can work around this. Uh, system calls. Uh, right now, there is no support for system calls other than simulating them. Uh, the thing this is probably going to be the most likely way to do this is you create an OS model. Uh, I mean, you take an open source libc, you stub out enough of the actual backend execution and give it enough fake data, you build it as an LLVM blob, and this becomes another one of the things you link into your GPU kernel. And ideally, your optimizer will then get rid of all the unused libc calls and like possibly inline a whole bunch of stuff to just a single value. So like you effectively fake an OS model with uh, a system call library like Musil or something compiled to LLVM. Uh, link constant propagate and then you're back in business. Uh, that's the very likely way to do this. Uh, sometimes this might not be possible, especially if you're targeting an OS where maybe like you don't have, like you have other external libraries you can't really touch here. Uh, what you could do, uh, and I, this doing this is possible, but it's like a little out there is so you can then like at your system call execution state, you can take your like CPU and memory state and you can save it. And then you can throw it against a real emulator or like some kind of hardware target and then run this and then slurp up the results back to further execution. Like obviously you would want to like batch this up such that like you have a really big queue of things waiting to execute a system call and do some deduplication and then like execute this on like real hardware or a more serious emulator and write the results back and continue. But this is another option for harder targets where you can't just cheat and like simulate stuff by giving it some fake data. Uh, other very obvious limitations. Uh, threads, uh, interrupts, infinite loops all have a very similar problem and a similar solution set. Uh, right now, if you obviously if you statically translate something and you run into it, like you don't have threading support. Uh, the obvious fix to this is instead of translating at a function level, do something like translate at a basic block level and have a dispatch loop that will then dispatch to basic blocks and some intelligence to identify like things that invoke a new thread. And then you just add a scheduling layer, uh, ideally where like, you know, you execute a block from one thread, you switch, and then you execute a block from a different thread. Uh, it will be, it will like run it. Obviously you won't have like this, the same like, you know, It'll be it'll run like a finite view of like the possible like thread execution space. Uh, same thing for interrupts. Like right now, there's nowhere to deliver interrupts in the system. Uh, the ideally, like you would want some kind of carver modeling and like some way to pause and say an interrupt could arrive here, either by doing the thing where like you translate from the block level instead of the function level or the whole program level, or you do like a thing where Every time you execute one of your simulated system calls, you schedule a potential interrupt delivery. Uh, infinite loops, uh, this is a real and very big problem. Uh, there's not a great way to solve this other than, uh, the one, the GPU eventually will time out. Like it says a really, really long time, but it will eventually time out for you. But if you don't want to wait that long, uh, we can do some kind of like block count or something else to where you give it an exit once in a while and have a set limit for how many instructions or how many blocks you are willing to execute per uh, GPU kernel invocation. Uh, some more, more, more really cool stuff that, yes, I have, I have, time, I have like less than two minutes. I really wanted to get to the slides. I'm very excited to this one and to the next one. So uh, one of the big problems you have is divergence. And so there's two cool solutions for this. this is one, uh, we can detect divergence at runtime. So already every thread that's executing is keeping track of its code coverage hash. Uh, what threads can do is they can vote. They can essentially say like, do we all have the same value for a certain variable? And what you're able to do is all the threads can then say at every like 
so it's certain you can sprinkle in like these sync points, and then every thread can say like, do we have the same value for code coverage hash? And if the value is no, then like if things get too divergent, what you're able to do at that point is then say, we are going to then like stop this execution. Like we are we have turned this specific warp, like we've turned these 32 threads into a slow serial processor. We are going to save our state and we're going to kick this off somewhere for later analysis and reprioritize it. But like we've already found new code coverage. We don't need to do this. We have we have diverged in our inputs. Put this on a queue and wait until we find more stuff that goes in the same queue and then execute this in parallel. But continue on with like the stuff that is still going down places you haven't found yet. So you can detect that you are doing a bad thing at runtime and stop doing the bad thing. Uh, come on, next slide. Yes. Oh, so the yes. I, I will try to get into this real quick. So, and I, I'm going to embarrass myself by talking about a topic I don't really know a lot about, but uh, it's the idea is too intriguing not to mention it. Uh, so, in zero knowledge cryptography, and like I only know this by osmosis from talking to other people at Trail of Bits who actually do this, so I'm probably going to completely ruin that explanation and like do not trust me in anything about zero knowledge cryptography. It is not my thing. Uh, but what you can do is you can translate a certain computation or a program into a circuit. And one of the properties of the circuit that you translate it into is that it will execute the same like gates regardless of the input you give it to avoid the problem of leaking timing information. So you always execute the same stuff. So no timing information gets leaked for your, like, your zero knowledge proof system. And if you have this circuit that you always execute the same gates in every input, you can then like take your, if you can take a program and you can come put it into the circuit representation and run it on the GPU, you will have solved the divergence problem by construction. Like this thing, like short, sure, you may blow up the size of it enormously, but you are guaranteed that you will never diverge execution because you have constructed it in such a way that it is impossible. And like it's improved, proved by math. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this is a thing you can actually do uh, to a degree. Like we ha on a DARPA program, we are actually working to enable like zero knowledge proof against small but real x86 programs. So like there is like a thing, like there is a path forward here to where we could possibly do the thing and eliminate divergence completely. 